I speak this morning in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Imagine, if you will, a time of great national anxiety. A time of political conflict, of clashing cultural expectations, divided leadership, great social and political upheaval. Imagine a time of reckoning, where the fabled story of a people has begun to crack, and the overburdened, suffering citizens are not yet sure whether those cracks will fill with light or be flooded with poison. Imagine a litany of mornings, day after day, of a people who awaken uncertain about whether or not this day is the day that will finally come for them. The day when destruction will not only cross their national borders, but cross the threshold of their own front door. I know that each one of you is now thinking about the kingdom of Judah in the 5th and 6th centuries BC. In the year 587, the Neo-Babylonian Empire conquered the city of Jerusalem. They sent thousands into exile for 70 years. The Jewish people are scattered, their leaders are deported or killed, and the Temple of Solomon, the beacon of praise, hope, and worship of the living God, is ransacked and destroyed. After those 70 years of exile, the prophet Zechariah returns to a Jerusalem that is still in turmoil. He returns to this ruined city that may yet build a new temple. It may yet rise from the ashes. But it is clear that the things that once were will never be the same again. And so Zechariah prophesies. He stands in the midst of a wasted city and lays his words at the feet of a broken people. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey. And he shall command peace to the nations. Rejoice greatly. Rejoice. Has Zechariah not seen the news? What could possibly be cause for rejoicing in the midst of unprecedented upheaval? And yet herein in the scriptures we find a beautiful portrait of the very work of a prophet. The prophet is sent to turn people back to God. In the rubble of the 5th and 6th centuries, Zechariah's prophetic mission was this. He was to remind God's people that God had not abandoned them. God had not left his people without hope. Indeed, Zechariah's own name is a sign of this promise. Because the name Zechariah itself means God remembered. When the city of Jerusalem, the city that was supposed to usher in the kingdom of heaven, had fallen and all hope seemed impossible, even then, God remembered. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Jerusalem, for your king comes to you triumphant and victorious. To rejoice in the midst of destruction was an act of holy defiance. It was a radical act and offering of trust. It would be just over five centuries later when this king would arrive at last, humbly entering the city of Jerusalem on a donkey. Five centuries, several lifetimes from the burning streets and the children of exile. And yet, God remembered. 
Our gospel this morning comes to us from the 11th chapter of St. Matthew. And at this chapter's beginning, John the Baptist sends word to Jesus from prison and asks him, are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Every prophet in the Old Testament had pointed the way to this coming king, and John himself had prophesied, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his pathway. Was this Jesus, finally the Messiah, that God had long promised? Indeed, God remembered. God remembered and sent his son, Jesus, into this world of ours to reconcile us to the heart of our creator. And when Jesus comes among us, he finds us standing in the ruins of our own broken Jerusalems. He finds us bound up within that condition that St. Paul so poignantly discusses and articulates in this letter to the Romans this morning. He finds a people who are burdened by sin. He finds a people overwhelmed by the demands of impossible laws. A people so mired in our own failure that we do the very things we hate. Because sooner or later, I think all of us know this, sooner or later, no matter how strong we think we are, no matter how obedient or pious or lawful or lucky, we eventually come to the realization that we are not God. We are human beings. And as the confession in the 1928 Book of Common Prayer proclaims, there is no health in us. And yet, God remembers us. When Jesus Christ came among us in his holy incarnation, it was God himself, God himself, who entered into this world of decay. We are no longer lonely prophets proclaiming hope in a God that we cannot touch, that we cannot see. But we are brothers and sisters with this living person of Jesus, clothed in humility and radiant with grace. God himself walks among our burning streets. God himself steps over the rubble of our conquered city. God himself reaches out to touch the broken bodies of the poor and those ravaged by sickness. He gathers the terrors of all these times that have come before us and burdened us impossibly, and in one final and radical act of salvation, God insists that the powers of sin and death will never prevail again. The crucifixion of Jesus looked like that destruction of Jerusalem. It looked like the invasions of the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the slavers of Egypt and the plagues of Israel and the death of hope and the triumph of evil all distilled into one brutal slaughter. Can you imagine being a disciple of Jesus and seeing your beloved teacher who had promised you the dawning of a new era. And you watch him be killed and shut up in a hillside tomb and you don't know what's going to happen next. A lifetime in Holy Saturday. What could possibly be cause for rejoicing. And yet, God remembered. On the morning of that third day, the stone at the tomb was rolled away, and as the women searched for the body of Jesus, the angels asked them, why do you look for the living among the dead? Jesus lived and lives Indeed. And in this glorious movement, 
that we commemorate throughout the liturgical year, this glorious movement of his passion, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. This is God's earthly, material, and living assurance that he will not forget us. And so we find ourselves in this year of our Lord, 2020. It is a time of national anxiety, a time of political conflict, a time when the fabled story of a people has begun to crack and the suffering, overburdened citizens are not yet sure whether those cracks will be filled with light. And God remembers us. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. To rejoice in the midst of a world in destruction is an act of holy defiance. We are called, all of us, to this radical offering of trust. For the living Christ now reigns at the hand of the Father, and the things that once were will never be the same again. Amen.